to. Okay, I'm going to press start. Great. So welcome everyone uh, to the uh, third of our uh, Faroe lectures. And uh, we've had quite a good turnout for these. So uh, I'm glad that they're of use. I'm uh, Ron Cohen from the Carnegie Institution. And this uh, series is uh, co-sponsored by the Center for Materials by Design. The Carnegie Institution for Science is in uh, Washington, DC. Our, our lab is in Washington, DC. And uh, we do a variety of uh, materials. We're now called the Earth and Planets Laboratory, but we also do uh, materials uh, research as well and high pressure research and chemistry and physics and so forth. Anyway, uh, today we're really excited to have uh, um, Cyrus Dreyer as our speaker. Cyrus Dreyer is at Stony Brook, a professor at Stony Brook University in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And he's also at the Flat Iron Institute at the Center for Computational Quantum Physics. And his title today for his talk is Non-Adiabatic Born Effective Charges in Metals and the Drude Weight. And let me just, uh, I'm gonna say a few more introductory uh, remarks in just a second, but let me just uh, uh, clarify uh, the process. So uh, Cyrus is gonna speak for about uh, 45 minutes and then there's going to be a uh, 15 minute uh, question and answer period. And you can type your uh, questions in uh, you can do that during the talk too, if you want, but we probably won't handle them until afterwards. And in the event that you have a lot of questions, we can uh, promote you to uh, actually appear on screen. So uh, think about that if, if that's something you wanna do. Uh, and uh, um, we also have a, a panelist here, uh, Jorge Iniguez, uh, who, who uh, uh, will, uh, will also be here for the question and answer period. So Cyrus has worked on a variety of uh, interesting problems in materials uh, for both uh, electronic and optoelectronic devices and works on uh, mainly density functional theory and other uh, electronic structure methods on properties uh, that involve uh, electric polarization, piezoelectricity, flexoelectricity, and so forth. Uh, he's one of the developers of the Abinet code, and he's worked a lot on defects in semiconductors and insulators. I don't want to take time away from him, but just uh, introduction, he got his PhD at Santa Barbara, University of California, and then he was a postdoc at Rutgers University, and uh, after being also a postdoc in uh, Santa Barbara. And, um, and his research interests involve developing and implementing computational techniques based on density functional theory to explore the properties of electronic materials. And without any further ado, I will turn it over to Cyrus. So Cyrus, it's all yours. Thanks, Ron, for the, the introduction. Um, give me one second. So can you see my slides good? Yep, all looks good. Okay, thanks. So uh, yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks, uh, everyone for, for coming. So I was uh, really excited to, to give this talk to this audience, um, kind of motivated by a lot of the discussion and a lot of the uh, research that was presented at the Fair Electrics Conference in, in January. Um, and so there seems to be quite a bit of interest in polar properties of, of metals. And so that's going to be kind of the subject of, of this talk. Uh, and it was recently, we recently put it on the archive um, uh, in this recent work. So um, as Ron said, uh, my name is Cyrus Dreyer. Uh, my collaborators on this work were uh, Max Stengel from uh, Barcelona, who is, who is known to, to many of you. Uh, he was responsible for many of the formal developments in this work. And then we were kind of pushed along this direction by Sinisa Co from uh, University of California, Riverside. So uh, the, the audience today is probably one of the, the few audiences that doesn't need much of an introduction on Born Effective Charges, which is what I'll be talking about, but I'll just kind of uh, start at the beginning. Um, so uh, in, in any material that has different atomic sublattices, um, there it has some bonding character that is ionic. And oftentimes in materials, we uh, 
we uh, relate uh, a given ionic charge to a given sublattice uh, based on how charge is transferred between sublattices in the material. And then, of course, if we have uh, atoms or ions with a given charge and we apply an electric field to the material, then these charged ions will feel a force. And the force will be, of course, proportional to their charge uh, from chapter one of, um, of Jackson, for example. And so um, this is a very intuitive idea, of course, but the, the, uh, the details of what exactly this charge is, is I think a little bit less intuitive. So this charge is a dynamical charge. It's not uh, a, a static charge that would come from kind of drawing circles around atoms and associating the different charge density in the material to a given atom. Um, dynamical charge in that it's defined via perturbations. And it's, it's often referred to as uh, the Born Effective Charge, um, or Z star. So Z star is the notation that I'll use in this talk. And uh, Born Effective Charge, of course, named after uh, Max Born. So um, uh, it's named after Max Born uh, because of his uh, seminal work, along with others, in the dynamical theory of crystal lattices. Uh, of course, Max Born has done uh, a lot of other amazing contributions to physics, including uh, interpretations of wave functions in quantum mechanics and um, some contributions to kind of materials, physics, materials, chemistry, and reactions. Um, one of Max Born's claims to fame, which you might not know, is his role in the uh, award-winning musical movie Grease. So uh, he was actually instrumental to the making of this movie, which you may not know. Um, it came out actually after he died um, and he has nothing to do with John Travolta, but he is in fact, Olivia Newton-John's grandfather. So that's just a fun fact about Max Born that you can impress your colleagues with if you didn't know it already. Anyway, so back to, to science. Um, so what we know about the Born Effective Charge is um, it's, as I said before, it's not a static charge and it's, it's not quite um, the corresponding to the nominal ionic charge that we might expect for a material. And the reason, of course, is that um, we might have some uh, electrons that are tightly bound uh, to a nuclei forming uh, what is basically a rigid ion. Um, but we'll also have some uh, uh, less tightly bound electrons uh, whose charge density will deform in the field, and those will both contribute to the Born effective charge. And we can see this if we take, for example, a very ionic material like sodium chloride, and we calculate or measure the Born effective charges, we get something that's a little bit different from the, um, from the formal uh, uh, ionic charges that we, we might expect. And then, of course, in the materials that are near and dear to many in the audience, uh, the ABO3 perovskites, we've known for a long time that um, the Born effective charges on these materials are anomalous. Um, for example, if we look at oxygen, um, the, the a specific equatorial or uh, apical oxygen sublattice, um, we see that the Born effective charges, for example, are very different than the minus two uh, uh, kind of nominal ionic charge we would expect for oxygen. And this has a lot of effects on the properties. And then the other um, thing that I will just remind you about, about Born effective charges that makes them different from static charges is that the Born effective charges are a, a tensor, not just a scalar. So we can see this in uh, an example of a very anisotropic material. Um, this is two dimensional hexagonal boron nitride. So we have these layers of uh, boron nitride that are bonded strongly in plane and then very weakly out of plane. And if we calculate the Born effective charges for the different sublattices of this material, uh, we get very different results if we consider uh, the electric field and the response along the Z axis perpendicular to the plane or parallel to the plane. So perpendicular, it's something like 0.76 electrons. Parallel to the plane, it's closer to the nominal um, ionic charges you would expect for boron nitride. Minus, plus and minus 2.7. Okay, so I think um, many of you uh, knew those facts about Born effective charges very well already. Um, uh, so just to, to make things a little bit more formal, so um, if we want to define the Born effective charge, uh, for example, in a first principles calculation, 
um, then we could do it in a variety of different ways. So this is for a, a certain sublattice in the material kappa. So throughout the talk, kappa will correspond to sublattice. Um, the uh, we we have these two indices that correspond to the direction of the perturbation um, and the direction of the the uh, response that we're measuring to define the Born effective charge. So I already talked about defining it in terms of a, a force versus electric field. Um, we could also define Born effective charge in terms of a polarization with respect to an atomic displacement. So displacing an atomic sublattice kappa in direction J, measuring the polarization. And then um, we could also uh, define it in terms of a, a charge density response for an atomic displacement. So displacing an atom, seeing how the charge density responds, taking the dipole moment of that response. And of course, uh, as, I, as I've been saying, board effective charge is a dynamical charge. And we see where all of our definitions are via some perturbation, either an electric field or an atomic displacement. Um, and so uh, one of the kind of interesting things about the Born effective charge is that even though it's a dynamical charge, it has uh, at least one very um, uh, one element that is uh, related to kind of a partitioning of a static charge in that there's a charge neutrality condition for the for the Born effective charges. So um, what, what I mean by that is if we take an element of the Born effective charge tensor, we sum it over atomic sublattices, then that quantity should vanish in, in, an, in a, uh, a, a crystal with translational symmetry. And this was shown rigorously uh, in this work by Pick, Cohen, and Martin, um, uh, and is a result of translational symmetry and overall charge neutrality of the crystal. And the reason is basically if we sum up uh, over the sublattices, the Born effective charges, what we're basically doing is taking the entire crystal and shifting it. And by the acoustic sum rule, we know that if we take the entire crystal and shift it, we shouldn't change any of its properties. We shouldn't induce any forces. We shouldn't induce any currents. And therefore, the Born effective charges are summed to zero. OK, so. Um, we, we use the concept and, and uh, calculations of Born effective charges in a variety of ways for understanding a variety of phenomenon. Um, of course, what's mainly uh, uh, of interest to, to many in the audience is uh, ferroelectric polarization. We can often um, describe the magnitude of polarization in terms of Born effective charges or polar distortions in terms of Born effective charges. Um, if we have lattice vibrations in ionic crystals, if we want to calculate uh, phonons, uh, we need Born effective charges for properties like the LO, the spilling between longitudinal optical and transverse optical modes. Um, also, uh, in transport, when we're interested in how electrons and holes scatter um, with polar vibrations in crystals, uh, we, we, the Born effective charge is, is in there. Um, also, dielectric screening, uh, the lattice contribution to dielectric screening, lattice contribution to electromechanical coupling, piezoelectricity, flexoelectricity. They have terms with Born effective charges. Um, optical spectra in the infrared and terahertz regime, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, most of the time, these aspects are discussed uh, in the context of insulators. Though many of them have kind of straightforward applications to metallic systems. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, there's a lot of current interest in, uh, in ferroelectric or polar metals. Um, also, of course, if we have transport in a material, that means it needs to have some carriers to transport. So almost by definition, it's metallic or at least doped. Um, and then uh, so on for a lot of the other cases. So um, the question that we would want to answer is, is um, uh, can we uh, use the concept of a born effective charge in a, in a metallic system? And so if we come back to our definitions of the born effective charge, um, at first sight, they don't seem to, to uh, port well from insulators to metals. So um, if we in a metal, we have free charge, and the free charge will screen any electric fields 
that we try to apply. Uh, in addition, they will screen any, um, any moments of the charge density that come from atomic displacements. And then, um, as we know from the work of David and Raffaella, that the, uh, the polarization is not well-defined in a, in a metallic system. And so at first sight, um, the Born effective charges may be expected to, to either vanish or not be well-defined, and in any case, not be very useful for, for metallic systems. Now, uh, of course, what, uh, what many in the audience also probably already know is that those arguments are, are pretty naive and they, they rest on basically the idea that uh, atomic displacements or electric fields are applied uh, in a very slow manner. And, uh, and in that case, we can, we can uh, do our calculations or think about our materials in terms of the adiabatic approximation. So the adiabatic approximation just saying that um, the, for example, atomic motion is so slow that uh, electrons are always in their instantaneous ground states and therefore can move around and screen any fields uh, or any um, electrostatic perturbations. Um, but oftentimes in metals, uh, what we know is we have to go beyond the adiabatic approximation. We have to think about uh, atoms moving at a finite velocity or oscillating with a finite frequency or consider electric fields or screening of electric fields um, at finite frequencies. And so that will be the approach that we'll take. So we will consider a non-adiabatic Born effective charge. So a Born effective charge that's not uh, determined uh, under the adiabatic assumption, um, which then has a, a, a dependence on frequency of atomic displacements. And then we will explore the low frequency limit of this quantity in metals to see if we can get a definition of a Born effective charge that's applicable to metallic systems. And, um, and also the low frequency limit is oftentimes the, the interesting, an interesting limit in materials, uh, places where uh, phonon frequencies uh, uh, reside, for example. Okay. So um, let's define a, a, uh, a more generalized definition of a Born effective charge. So I, I just write kind of a very general uh, definition here. So we have uh, a Born effective charge for sublattice kappa, or non-adiabatic Born effective charge. It has some indices, again, alpha and beta. And now it has some explicit dependence on frequency. Uh, we'll call it the frequency of the atomic motion. Um, and uh, it's defined in terms of a susceptibility, which basically measures the, the current response or the response to a, a vector scalar potential perturbation um, from an atomic displacement. And so um, this susceptibility uh, has a frequency dependence and um, it also can have a, a, de a spatial dependence. It can be non-local but we're taking the, the uh, wave vector Q to zero limit to get the macroscopic response. So um, this will be our kind of starting definition of the non-adiabatic Born effective charge. And then we'll ask some questions about this Born effective charge to see if it is uh, well-defined and useful in metallic systems. So first of all, does it have a well-defined limit as omega goes to, to zero? Does it have a, a, a scalar or a, uh, a quantity that we can uh, define as a, as a Born effective charge in a metal. Um, also, what happens to that charge neutrality condition for the Born effective charge, that sum rule that I mentioned before, where the sublattice sum of Born effective charges goes to zero. Um, and then, of course, how can we, can we calculate this thing? Can we, uh, what, is, what is values does it take in, um, in metals and in dope semiconductors in, in, in some interesting systems. Okay, so uh, we'll start with this, this first question, does it have a well-defined limit for omega goes to zero? And the way that we, uh, that we kind of tackle that question is by uh, considering a, um, a similar response function that we, we know a lot about. So um, it's, this equation looks very similar to the one I just showed, but this is the, instead of the current atomic displacement uh, uh, susceptibility, it's the current current susceptibility. And therefore we just have 
uh, here the optical conductivity of a material. And so what we know about the optical conductivity is that if we take the frequency to zero limit, we get a, a divergence. Um, and this divergence is, uh, gives the Druda peak in the longitudinal optical conductivity. And the reason there's a divergence is because if we take the omega goes to zero limit of this susceptibility, we get a, a, a constant. And uh, this constant is known as the, the Druda wave. And so if we get a constant here, we, we get a divergence as one over omega. So a little bit more about the Druda weight, because as you probably could tell from the title, it will feature more prominently in, the, in this talk. So there's a lot of ways of writing down the Druda weight and a very nice uh, kind of review of the, the physics of Druda weight um, uh, that I would recommend here. Um, and the, uh, uh, in this way, we've written it down as a, a Fermi surface integral. So we have here a derivative of the Fermi function. So it's only sensitive around the, the Fermi surface. Um, and then we have some band velocities uh, in different directions. And so the, the Druda weight basically gives the density of free electrons available for conduction. And as a result, it's non-zero in all metals. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, you can consider it as a definition of a metal to have a non-zero Druda weight and a, def, and a definition of an insulator to, for the Druda weight to vanish. So um, since it's non-zero in all metals, then no matter what metal we look at, we get this peak in the optical conductivity as we go to low frequency, which is, I think, from chapter one or chapter two of Ashcroft and Merman. Okay, so the, the um, optical conductivity diverges at low frequency. So what about the Born effective charge? Well, the, the difference between the Born effective charge and the optical conductivity is that um, instead of having two um, current, uh, uh, a current perturbation and, and a current response, we have a atomic displacement perturbation and a current response. And so if we consider a crystal with time reversal symmetry, the uh, current response is time reversal odd while the, the atomic displacement response is time reversal even. Whereas in this case, we have two time reversal odd quantities. And so um, at zero frequency, um, we get a, uh, this is even and we get a, a finite value, the Druda weight um, for the Born effective charge, zero frequency, um, the, the susceptibility vanishes. So um, we're gonna stick to time reversal symmetric crystals in this, in this talk. And um, basically this is a statement that um, in a time reversal symmetric metal, uh, we can't have a steady current in response to a static atomic displacement. And so um, we find from that, that our uh, zero, we have a, a well-defined zero frequency limit, the chi goes to zero and that cancels the divergence in that, in this one over omega. Okay, so uh, so far so good. We have a, a, a non-adiabatic born effective charge with a, with a low frequency, uh, a well-defined low frequency limit uh, that might be applicable to metals. Um, and now the next question we ask is what happens to, the, to that sum rule? So um, as, I, as I said at the beginning, when we uh, have a born effective charge in an insulator and we do a sublattice sum over kappa, every element of the Born effective charge tensor has to vanish. So is this still the case in, in a metal in terms of this non-adiabatic Born effective charge? And um, the answer is, is no. Um, and we can, we can see this uh, again by uh, comparison between the Born effective charge and the optical conductivity. And so before I was just kind of comparing them at a heuristic level, but we can actually uh, get a direct proportionality between um, not just the, the Born effective charge, but the sublattice sum of the Born effective charge and the, the optical conductivity. And so um, I'll, uh, in, a, in a second, I will um, uh, give a kind of an argument about why this is the case. Uh, and the, the more detailed argument is, is of course in the paper, um, but for now, I'll just take this as, as the result. And um, uh, 
and then if we take the low frequency limit of both sides of this equation, uh, then we get that the sublattice sum of the Born effective charges is uh, exactly proportional to the Drude weight of the material. So we can see from this expression that the um, the the sum rule uh, of the Born effective charges, so the the sum of the Born effective charges will not vanish in uh, in a metal because the Drude weight is always finite. And we, of course, recover the charge neutrality condition in insulators because, uh, by definition, the Drude weight vanishes there. So we consider this a, a generalized Born effective charge sum rule. So, as I said, I'll give an argument about why this is the case in a second. But first, um, what does it what does it mean physically? And so, physically, uh, what we can think of is that, uh, as I said. At the, the very beginning, the sublattice sum of the Born effective charge, the perturbation in this case is basically taking the whole crystal lattice and shifting it. And if we do this at a, at a finite frequency, then there's some charge that, that uh, cannot keep up with the, the uh, shift in the, in the lattice that could come from a phonon frequency uh, or, or similar. And this charge density that is kind of left behind by the atomic displacement is exactly the free charge in the material, the free charge in the metal that's not tightly bound to the, the ions. And, um, and that free charge is given by the Drude weight. So we get an extra uh, current that is uh, given by the fact that the, the free charge is left behind and the free charge defined by the Drude weight. Okay, so that, that's kind of a, a physical um, uh, picture of, uh, of this, this result. So I'll just again give a, a sketch of the argument um, as to why this is the case. Um, coming back to the Drude weight, uh, I said before that the Drude weight can be written in terms of these band velocities. And in, in the simplest case where we have uh, uh, no uh, vector potential fields or, or non-local operators in the Hamiltonian, uh, the, the band velocities uh, can be written as momentum matrix elements between, uh, between our bands in, a, in our single particle calculation. And um, the, so the Drude weight is related to the momentum operator and the momentum operator also generates infinitesimal displacements of, of the Hamiltonian. So if we consider uh, the Hamiltonian, uh, the, the uh, first order Hamiltonian in terms of an atomic displacement, and we sum up again over all sublattices. Once again, that's taking the entire crystal and shifting it. And uh, that is uh, uh, related to uh, the momentum operator uh, generating an infinitesimal displacement of the Hamiltonian. And so that kind of relation between displacements and the, this momentum operator formally gives us uh, the result that relates the, the Born effective charge to the optical conductivity and the Drude weight. Okay, so I'll also just make some, some comments maybe for some of the, the experts in the, in the audience. Um, a useful way to think about these, these uh, lattice distortions um, that was uh, pioneered by, by Max Stengel and, and also in this paper by, with Max uh, and David um, is, is to think about atomic displacements in terms of uh, so-called metric waves. So you've probably seen some talks at the Ferroelectrics workshop from, from Max on this concept. Um, uh, I'll just kind of quickly uh, reiterate the idea is that if we have some atomic displacements, in this case, we have a wave of maybe a phonon uh, atomic displacement, then um, we, can, we can consider it as, uh, uh, as formally as uh, performing a coordinate transformation on the system so that we take all of the displaced atoms and move them back to their original positions indicated by the vertices of these lines. And if we do that, then all the perturbation is contained in kind of the, the metric of the new coordinate system. And um, if we, if we uh, consider uh, doing a metric perturbation, 
we can write again this sublattice sum of the uh, atomic displacements, uh, the, the perturbed Hamiltonian from atomic displacements in terms of uh, this metric uh, perturbation. And then if we're at finite frequency, an extra uh, vector potential perturbation. And um, one of the, by definition, the, this, uh, this, metric, uh, this metric perturbation vanishes at Q equals zero. And that gives us, again, a relationship between atomic deformation perturbations and, um, and uh, vector potential perturbations. Uh, and that can also be another way of thinking of the relationship between uh, the Born effective charge and the optical conductivity. So just a few other comments about the, the results. So um, we, we, our arguments kind of apply to the case uh, of, for example, optical phonons, which have a finite frequency at Q goes as Q, at Q equals zero. Our reason being is uh, you may have noticed we took the Q goes to zero limit first, and then the omega goes to zero limit, uh, and that, that ordering was important. Um, also, we assume in quotes, clean conductors, uh, meaning that the, the frequencies of the, uh, that we're con considering are much larger than the scattering rates. So if we have a dirty conductor where we have a, uh, where this criteria isn't fulfilled, then we would expect um, the electrons by a scattering to relax down to their equilibrium positions and the uh, non-adiabatic Born effective charges to vanish. Um, also, we're assuming that the frequencies are, are smaller than any interband resonances. Um, and we think we sh this should hold also in the presence of dissipation, though we've been, we haven't discussed this before. But of course, in any real metal, you don't have a divergence in the optical conductivity, but you have a, a peak on it with. OK. So. Um, that's the answer to our second question, what happens to the sum rule? So we have this generalized Born effective charge sum rule where um, the sublattice sum of the Born effective charges is proportional to the Druda weight. So finally, uh, the last question that I've posed in this, in this talk is, uh, can we calculate this quantity? Can we, uh, and what values does it take in, in, in materials? So um, of course, I wouldn't pose this question if the answer wasn't yes. So we, we've done uh, calculations of the non-adiabatic Born effective charge in the context of density functional perturbation theory. And um, this is a really busy slide with a lot of equations and a lot of indices. So just kind of for the experts in the audience. Um, so the, the non-adiabatic Born effective charge can be written down in a similar way as the, the um, normal insulating adiabatic Born effective charge, we have to compute some responses to electric field perturbations as well as atomic displacement perturbations. And uh, in this work, what we, what we did is we, um, we broke up the, the expression for the non-adiabatic Born effective charge into two uh, terms. So we have, of course, the ionic or in our density functional theory context, the pseudo potential charge. Um, uh, then we have this term here, which involves um, uh, the block functions, uh, kind of buried curvatures with respect to reciprocal lattice vector and atomic displacements. So this term um, would be the, the adiabatic uh, board effective charge in an insulator. We would just would be able to calculate it just with this term. Um, the difference in the case of a metal is that we are sum over bands, not only just includes filled bands, but it includes some extra uh, empty bands because of course in a metal we have partially filled bands. And so we can't just truncate exactly at the filled band case. And so um, we have this, this number of bands in our calculation big M. And uh, what, we, what you can see is, what, or what you can show is that this term here will depend, its value will depend on how many empty bands we include. Um, but uh, this, the, the second term in kind of the electronic part of the Born effective charge, um, which depends, this F bar is the derivative of the Fermi function, 
with respect to eigenvalues. So it's um, again, sensitive to the properties around the Fermi level. This term also depends on the amount of bands that we have in our calculation, which again is somewhat arbitrary. We just include enough to contain all of the electrons with some empty ones. Um, and so these two terms, uh, they both depend on you know, this computational detail of our calculation, but uh, together they give a, a, a well-defined quantity that, is, uh, uh, that doesn't depend on the number of bands in our calculation. And, and so by, by doing this, this kind of splitting up of the, of the terms in our calculation, we can avoid, for example, the sum over states that appears in, in, a, in a more naive uh, expression for the, the non-adiabatic foreign effective charge. So um, I won't say anything more about that. And again, if this, none of this made any sense, then don't worry, you won't need it to understand much more in the talk. Um, also, I'll just kind of flash up the, the computational approach that we used for these calculations. So um, our response functions and ground state properties, et cetera, were, were calculated in the Abinet code. Um, we used uh, uh, ONCV pseudopotentials, uh, both LDA and PB exchange correlation functionals, depending on the material. And then also what I'll show is that a lot of the quantities here require very fine integration over the Fermi surface. Um, and for that, we use the 1E90 interface with Abinet uh, to do some 1E interpolation of the, the quantities in our calculation. Okay, so um, I'll show results for, for three test cases. Um, the first is FCC aluminum, uh, just a very simple metal. Now you should note that uh, FCC aluminum has no optical phonon modes. So the physics of the Born effective charge are probably not that applicable in this case, but it's a good test of our methodology. Um, then we'll look at two uh, uh, systems that are insulating um, in, in their ground state, but can be doped. And this will allow us to compare the Born effective charges uh, in a conducting system, a doped insulator, um, with the, the uh, insulating Born effective charges. And then I'll also show just some recent calculations. They're actually not in the paper. Um, they're, they're quite recent um, on uh, palladium cobaltate. Palladium cobaltate uh, is a delafosite material that has a lot of very interesting properties, which I won't discuss. Um, but basically it's considered because it is a ionic metal, meaning that it just has uh, different, uh, it's a metal intrinsically, but it has different sublattices, different atomic sublattices, unlike aluminum. Okay, so um, I think we all know uh, uh, aluminum is kind of a prototypical simple metal. Um, uh, we can also uh, confirm uh, our, in our computational implementation that it doesn't depend on uh, the number of bands that we include in our calculation that's shown here. I think for the sake of time, I'll just skip over that and show the results for the sum rule. So here I'm plotting uh, the, the units of the X axis are electrons, the units of the Y, or sorry, the units of the Y axis are electrons, the units of the X axis is the number of K points we use to integrate over the Bre1 zone. So just a convergence parameter. And we can see that the Born effective charge in aluminum uh, definitely doesn't vanish. In fact, it, it, it uh, converges to a quantity, uh, to a result around two electrons. And um, if we look at the, the Drew to weight or the negative of the Drew to weight, um, you can ignore uh, the, the, the purple dotted, dotted line for now. Um, I can come back to that if there's any interest, but um, just can, Considering the black line, it takes a while to converge, but once it does, it also converges to a value of around two. And if we add the two together, uh, just focusing on this red curve, we can see that um, it converges basically to zero. The sum rule is accurately satisfied for FCC aluminum. Okay, so that's a, a, a nice test of the methodology. Um, we can also, we, we now turn to some more complicated systems, systems that have optical phonon modes. So maybe the physics is, is more interesting or important. 
So we take two uh, systems. The first one is uh, tin sulfide. It's a 2D layered compound. The structure is here. If we look at the electronic structure, it has a gap. Um, uh, so it's an insulator and it has a, a very simple conduction band. So it's just this single band that's some uh, a hybridization of, of sulfur P and, and tin S. And so to dope this material, we will be adding electrons into this, this uh, conduction band. And then the other material that we'll look at, cubic strontium titanate, um, known very well, I think, to many people in the audience. Um, it has its conduction band is a little bit more complicated. Um, it's, a, it's a manifold of titanium T2G uh, uh, 3D states. And we'll be adding electrons into those states in order to dope strontium titanate. So first of all, how are we, how are we going to dope in our calculations? So we'll start off with a, with a very simple approximation. Um, we will call it the rigid band approximation. And in that case, we're basically taking all of the, the properties of the material from the um, insulating calculation, the ground state calculation. And all that we're modifying to, to describe the doping are the, um, are the, uh, the, the Fermi functions. So by, by uh, changing the occupation factors of the Fermi functions, then we are um, adding electrons into the material. Um, one detail is that we, we need to, uh, we're trying to model a charge neutral system. So we, we need to associate this added charge with one of the sublattices, one of the ionic sublattices. Um, of course, in a real experiment, we would do maybe perhaps some chemical doping of one of those sublattices. And the Born effective charge, because it includes an ionic part and an electronic part, will depend on which sublattice we associate the added uh, positive charge to. So that, that we'll need to specify. So um, these are the results for tin sulfide. So I'm plotting the Born effective charge versus Fermi level. In the background, you can see the, the um, density of states of this single conduction band. Um, and uh, since the material is anisotropic, we can uh, we, we plot the, the Born effective charges on the tin and sulfur sublattices for both the in-plane X and out-of-plane Z directions. And then the solid lines are if we attribute the extra positive charge to compensate the electrons that we add to the tin sublattice, um, the dotted lines is for the sulfur sublattice. And so we can see that the more effective charges do change uh, as we dope. Um, and there's some quantitative or even qualitative differences depending on how we, um, how we assume that the material was dope, where will we associate the extra positive charge. I'll come back to that in the case of strontium titanate because it's a little more clear uh, in that case. But we can add up all of these born effective charges, either in the X or the Z direction. And, um, and if we uh, then test the sum rule by um, adding or subtracting the Drew to weight in those directions, then we get the red curves here, um, which, and we see that the sum rule is accurately satisfied uh, all the way across the, the range of doping. And so you, you might be able to see that there are some little oscillations um, in, in the, in the Drew to weight and in the sum rule. And so just as kind of a technical note, uh, I'll point out the, the um, convergence of these quantities, especially the Drew to weight is quite difficult. Um, we need to go up to very large K meshes, which we do via one interpolation. Um, I think in the, in, um, uh, I think I'll skip any discussion of this because I'm running a little bit low on time. I'll also uh, skip that and go straight to uh, strontium titanate. Um, and uh, so in strontium titanate, we test a slightly more sophisticated way of doping the material. We actually use the virtual crystal approximation to, um, to include some lanthanum character on the A site, strontium titanate. And we can show that, that doing this procedure basically shifts the Fermi level into the band gap. And um, we can compare that to our rigid band approximation. Um, so this is the same plot I showed for tin sulfide, born effective charge versus Fermi level. Here we're doping across the entire T2G 
banned, of course, in an experiment, or uh, th this would be completely impossible, but um, just to kind of show the trends across the whole band. And these crosses here are using this virtual crystal approximation. The, the solid lines are using the uh, rigid band approximation. And you can see that they follow each other quite well, indicating that, um, that a lot of the response properties are not changed too much um, versus their insulating counterparts. We also see that the Born effective charges change significantly um, across this, albeit extremely large, doping range. Um, but if we sum them together, we, we, the Born effective charge sum rule is satisfied at all points. Um, and especially because we have a, a more complex Fermi surface here, um, uh, our convergence of the Born effective charges uh, is a lot trickier with respect to K points. Again, I will just skip this uh, in the interest of time. Um, one, one thing that is uh, maybe important, interesting for the physics is that the behavior of the Born effective charges, again, depends significantly on where we assume the, the chemical doping occurred. So what I showed before is doping on the strontium on the A site, for example, with lanthanum. We could also consider doping on the titanium site with, for example, niobium or on the oxygen site. And, um, and in all of these cases, the Born effective charges change significantly. For example, in this case, because we are adding electrons to the titanium T2G, but we are adding positive charge to the strontium. So those two compensate each other. Um, whereas if we're adding positive charge to the titanium as well as electrons to the T2G, then um, we get kind of a cancellation. Okay, so the last thing that I'll just mention in one uh, minute is uh, palladium cobaltate. It's, it's a metal uh, intrinsically, and uh, I think I'm just about out of time, but I'll, I'll just say that the, the calculated Born effective charges we find differ significantly from what we'd expect the nominal charges to be. Um, and we can confirm these nominal charges by looking at an insulating material that's quite similar and um, uh, yeah, we can discuss this more in the Q&A if you're interested. So I'm, I'm out of time. I'll put up my, my summary. Uh, we've defined these born effect, non adiabatic born effective charges uh, and demonstrated the sum rule with the DFPT implementation. Um, and it has hopefully some interesting implications, which, which I haven't talked about, but we can discuss. So thanks, thanks for your, your attention. That was, that was, that was great. Um, thank you so much. So we have time for some questions and, and uh, answer session. Uh, I have some maybe to start with. The uh, other panelists can, can join uh, too. Um, thank you, Cyrus. That was really exciting. So let's see. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I have my own questions, but let me start with one that's been typed in from James uh, Rondinelli. He says, have you examined the change in Z star for a system that can exhibit uh, ambipolar doping to see hole versus electron effects? Uh, he says it's very hard in strontium titanate, but could be done in tin oxide. And then he has a second question. Do you have any expectation? Well, actually it's related on the Z star dependence with electrons or holes. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, uh, you know, with the rigid band approximation, you can, quite easily also look at holes. And we, we did so for strontium titanate. Um, it's not included, as you said, because it's not very physically relevant for that material. Um, I, think, I think it will depend on the, the nature of the, the valence band. So where, where those, those, that positive charge is, is going to. So for example, in, in you know, tin oxide or strontium titanate, the, the holes would be in oxygen P states. And so the born effective charges for, for the oxygen sublattices would probably change more significantly. Great, great, great. Let me just check here. So, so I have a, a, a few questions. Um, so, so one of the definitions of born effective charge is, is uh, depend, uh, would be from a displacement relative to an applied electric field. So I guess that definition wouldn't apply anymore. Uh, you would have uh, to consider a, a, a finite frequency electric field. Oh, okay. So it would apply in that case then. Oh, okay, 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 okay. 
Very interesting. So, 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 so then you would actually be able to presumably uh, compute uh, how to, um, in principle, how, how to like move or put a periodic force on a particular atom by applying or set of atoms by applying a field. Uh, that's really interesting um, to me. <laughs> um, so an another question, so, so like for aluminum, you got two. Uh, is that have any intuitive meaning uh, that it comes out an integer or, or is that just an accident in the case of aluminum? Yeah, so it's not, it's not quite two, it's two point, point something. Um, I think that's kind of the question that we were trying to answer in the, um, uh, I mean, the, you know, in, in aluminum, since there's only one sub lattice, you basically get the Drew to weight uh, mm -hmm. with this calculation. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, that's the question we were trying to answer more or less uh, in the palladium cobalt tape, which is a little more interesting because it has, you know, different sub lattices. And, uh, and basically what we find is that the, the Born effective charges are quite different. They're not kind of obviously related to what we would expect the nominal charges to be in this material. So we're mm -hmm. still kind of looking at that. Mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned uh, uh, kind of uh, that you weren't going to talk about magnetic systems. So what happens in, in to the theory in that case? Yeah, so then we can't we can't so obviously, you know, declare that the, the low frequency limit is is well defined, but um, we can still do some calculations for those systems and maybe see what's going on. I don't have a good answer for you right now. OK, we have a lot of questions, so let me. Uh, keep going here. Uh, so uh, uh, ZQ Lu uh, says, very nice presentation. I've, I've been asking this question of people in my group for a while. Are there any experimental measurements for this, for any metals? Well, I guess that if you have the Drew to weight, you have the sum, but, but what about the individual terms? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's, that's something, that's another reason why we're interested in, in, in for example, palladium cobalt tape. It'd be interesting to look at uh, infrared uh, uh, optical measurements and, and see if we can relate these changes in the Born effective charge to the, to the, um, you know, the weighting of the peaks in an IR experiment, um, because that's directly related to the Born effective charges. So that's definitely something that we would, we would like to, to look at, but we haven't, we haven't, we haven't done any kind of careful comparisons yet. So, so, uh, Andrew has a couple questions. Did you want to ask, uh, I, I I, I'm going to, uh, you know what? I actually don't know the mechanism to promoting someone to uh, be on screen, but if, if Andrew wants to, he can type it in. Uh, but I'll just read them right now. Uh, one of them is your, he says, you're looking at finite frequency response. What are the upper and lower limits on the frequency range you could look at? Yeah, that's so that's a good question. question. So the, um, the, the frequency, you know, we're, we're, we're assuming, uh, I think I maybe, put some comments that I went over very quickly. We're assuming um, that the, the, the frequency is greater than the, the scattering rate in the material, which of course in our calculation is easy because we have pristine materials and also smaller than, than any interband resonances. So mostly we're interested in kind of the, the very low frequency limit uh, in, the, in those materials. And so we're, we're, we're doing our calculations basically to first order in the frequency. So it's not an explicitly finite frequency calculation. It's just the, the first order and perturbation theory uh, in the frequency. That's what we're calculating. Now, his second question seems to, uh, and again, I don't know if there's any way to bring him online, but, but uh, seems to me to apply to insulators, but maybe I'm not understanding it. I'll just read the question as it's written. It says, could you see charge ordering disappearing under finite field? I think you'd have, oh, so Andrew's here. Okay, so can you unmute yourself, Andrew? Or, uh, or can, uh, Gio, can you uh, please unmute him? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sorry, Ron, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, can you please bring uh, Andrew Rapp in uh, on, on screen and unmuted? Is he there? Working on that now, thank you. 
so so maybe while he's getting okay. online, okay. I can a few questions in the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Yi Wang says, are there any finite temperature effects due to the Fermi distribution? Yeah, so so um, in, in principle, there would be uh, uh, an effect due to finite temperature. We actually have to include some kind of smearing in our calculation just for numerical reasons. But you could imagine that that is, you know, um, that corresponds somehow to a physical temperature. Um, and so, yeah, since these quantities depend on the Fermi surface, there will be some, some effects from, from temperature, for sure. And uh, Jin Wung uh, Kim asks, says, nice right. talk. Can you explain more on the interpolation? Did you calculate velocity and displacement by using DFPT and interpolate them using Vanier interpolation? Exactly, yeah. So we, so we uh, all the response, the, the, um, all the, the quantities, in you know in this kind of somewhat complicated expression, these first order uh, wave functions and these um, these matrix elements were calculated with DFPT, and then um, and then we Wani interpolated uh, kind of all of these quantities onto a, a fine a fine mesh. Okay, so so uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Great, great, great. I don't see you, Hi, but Ron. I hear you. Hey, uh, hey. First of all, Go ahead. Ron, I'll speak for everyone else, and thank you for putting this together. Uh, we love having these kinds of seminars. And Cyrus, that was really great. So educational and clear. Um, so my other question is, the response you seem to be describing is like a very delocalized um, plasmon-like response. But could this apply to charge flow, such as uh, the disappearance of charge ordering? So if you have a manganite where you have uh, charge ordering due to different charge on different manganese ions, there's some driving frequency at which you could make a metal insulator transition happen and start to have non-adiabatic effects. Um, and you'd have the phenomenon you're discussing, but it would be more uh, Q dependent, I guess. Is this something that you could look at? Yeah, I, that's a really interesting uh, situation. Um, I mean, we've kind of just started scratching the surface. As you notice, I didn't talk much at all about implications, but I think that would be a really interesting uh, system to look at um, because, it, like you're saying, you would get kind of a very, a very large change in the the mm -hmm. um, you know the charge density around given atoms. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would be, it would be interesting to see if it, what the, what the signatures were, for example, in IR spectroscopy and, and then also, um, see, see what, how we could, how we could calculate this. Great, I don't, great, I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. There, there's one last question, then we're going to have to wrap up. So, so th th thank you also, uh, Andrew. So, so, uh, uh. So James uh, Rondinelli has another uh, follow-up question. He says, have you considered whether the non ebitic uh, Born effective charges can be used as a measure of electron correlation strength since the drew to weight is often suppressed in correlated metals? Yeah, wow, there, there's some good questions. So yeah, the, the um, uh, you know, all of the, these calculations and all of the formulas I showed have been, you know, in, in kind of single particle versions and of course, there is a there's a many body generalization to the Drew to weight, and in principle, a many body generalization to the Born effective charges. And I think it would be um, it'd be interesting to see if this still holds in the case of correlations, the the, the sum rule, etc. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, it, I I think I guess that's what what kind of Ron mentioned at the beginning of the question session. You you could imagine using for example, IR spectroscopy to get at the non adiabatic born effective charges and using that to get at the Drew to weight, which might be a, a, a more, um, more, more involved procedure than just doing photo emission or something like that. Um, but I definitely think the, that, that the effect of correlations on the theory, uh, as well as maybe on the experiment, would, would, be, would be interesting. Okay, thank you, Cyrus. Let me just, uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, share, uh, share my screen. I'm gonna pu pull up uh, my final uh, 
a summary here. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, Cyrus again for a great talk, uh, Cyrus Dreyer. And, uh, you know, uh, everybody, of course, is free to send them emails if you have for further questions. And I just want to point out we're having uh, more of these uh, lectures. So the next one will be July 8th with Dennis Meyer uh, from the no Norwegian University of Science and Technology on unproper ferroelectrics for sustainable nanotechnology. And uh, you can look at the uh, website for uh, the schedule coming up. And I also, I'm really excited about this. I mean, things are changing in the world. So I'm starting to think about uh, workshop, Fundamental Physics of Ferroelectrics 2022, 33rd uh, workshop. Uh, it, the dates are fixed here, February 6th through 9th, 2022. And, uh, but nothing else is fixed. I have a few volunteers for organizing committee, but could probably add another one or two. Uh, we're also uh, looking at, you know, uh, just starting to look at locations and venues. So if anybody wants to uh, offer their institution as a location for this, now probably we need to have it in the U.S. based on, uh, on uh, uh, funding. Uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, I'll hear probably if that's not true. Uh, but as far as I know, it should probably be in the U.S. and uh, and uh, the venue should be such that, uh, that people can get in without too many uh, security hassles uh, from uh, different countries. So uh, maybe we will have a uh, virtual version of that too. I mean, uh, a live streaming uh, uh, version of that too going on in, you know, with the uh, in-person meeting, you know, depending on what the uh, pandemic situation is in the world at that point. Okay, well, thank you all again and hope to see you all uh, next month. So spread the word about these uh, lectures and about the next workshop and thank you all for participating. Bye-bye. <laughs>